Welcome. This is the February 21st Open ZFS production user call. We have Stu, Daniel, Greg, Andrew, Jan, and myself. Others will probably trickle in. And uh, one quick point, Jim Salter mentioned, hey, he had some boot environment management news last week. I have I realized just as we wrapped up that I skipped over that because we had a whole bunch of other cool topics. And if he shows up, let's give that some time. A question way hypothetical from the jail zones call is should OpenZFS have some notion of whiteout files for containers? So it's a little flag that says, hey, pretend this isn't here. Just an open thought. If anyone has uh, ideas, we can go with that. But Daniel had some high level questions about record size alignment by data type with use cases. And I'll make a mention of write amplification. Uh, so Daniel, do you want to set that stage? Yeah, sure. So my my habit uh, comes from the early OpenCFS or, you know, maybe current OpenCFS wiki, um, which suggested to align up the, the record sizes with the, the database record sizes because of course, then you're limiting write amplification as much as possible. But the thing is, compression sort of confounds that because, you know, because <laughs> the compression is going to change what what occurs inside that, you know, inside that record size. And a larger one means more compression. Uh, so, yeah. So I. So anyway, there 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 does seem to be. There's certainly a trade-off between compression. So I think my basic my basic role is I still do it anyway. Like hope I get a couple of, you know, a couple of records in my 16K or whatever. Um, and then for, you know, for what do you call it? Replicas for like my for my replica uh, databases and for, uh, you know, anything anything that's sort of low priority, like I don't know, like my network monitor. Like that's that's pretty much a one way trip, right? It's not doing a lot of edits; it's just pumping data into it. So I use like a one meg record size, and of course, databases are mostly text, so you get hilariously small database sizes on compressed CFS, which is also amazing. So anyway, it's just a, it's just a trade off philosophy question. I, I get, I would say my gut is yes, the record size should basically just match whatever MySQL is and then pray that based on text, it slams, you know, tons of, uh, tons of block into that uh, ZFS record size. Um, and then we all live happily ever after. Are there hypothetical situations where compression is not your friend insofar as just thinking out loud here you have a one-to-one -one block relationship but then you try to put two close to one but it's spilling over to another and is actually less efficient than simply a, um, a lower use of one block go ahead jan so the well, compression isn't your friend is if your uh, data is already pre-compressed mm -hmm. Uh, in the application, the most extreme example of this would be uh, lossy compressions, like uh, let's say H two six five compressed video files. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get anything out of that encrypted data as well, because yeah, you... we are even just trying to compress it with RZ four. It's just a waste of CPU cycles because you're almost never going to find one block to compress. Uh, there is the um, early abort. It opinion, tastes it. Okay. Yeah, I was about to say that. I think there's a. Yeah, I think the an early, early abort. Thing so. Still tries to compress the first first quarter of the block size. I think. Twelve point five percent, as I recall. Okay, but yeah, so an eighth. But uh, if you know that this will never be successful on this data set, it's still just one eighth of the possible worst case CPU cycles wasted. Mm -hmm. And you still, even if you have a CPU cycle, the compute time you spend on that is a uh, write latency. You're never going to get back, no matter how many CPU uh, cycles you can throw at it. Uh, the other thing is um, what, I, in my opinion, changed things from try to match uh, the application or guest block size as 
precisely as possible is when OpenCFS gains support for a, a compressed arc, which doesn't have to be uh, physically continuous. So before that, it used to be that you had to, or let's say virtually continuous in kernel heap. So before that, you had to malloc like 128K or even worse, one megabyte of continuous address space in the kernel heap for uh, each block. But now with the, um, similar to how an MBUF chain works, the ZFS arc cache entries, uh, especially the compressed ones, can be a list of pages hmm. so that you're not suffering that much from fragmentation. And there the biggest gain is for databases like Postgres, which use the uh, file system buffer cache instead of a self-managed buffer cache in the database, because uh, databases tend to have lots of sorted data, which implies good compression unless it's afterward compressed. Uh, so uh, afterward encrypted. So here the biggest gains are that you can fit a vastly larger working set, like up to four or five times as much into your main memory, if you're lucky have a few indices on your database, uh, which doesn't reduce the write amplification, but is probably very worth the write amplification unless you are abusing your database as a, a write-only ring buffer or something. So here the biggest advantage is just that you're doing so much less reads and may be realistically able to fit non-trivial workloads in main memory on a budget. Mm -hmm. um, but is, the other advantage is if you're having slow disks or be it latency or uh, throughput, sometimes just spending CPU cycles on decompressing data is better than waiting for more data to move to your uh, backing disk storage. Mm -hmm. That's definitely so, the case, no? At least with spinning disks it is, and compressible data because LZ4 is so fast, it's not really true for even the STD, but for LZ4, it's often the case that at least for spinning disks, yeah, you can satisfy the disk bandwidth even for sequential reads. So you gain basically lin linear to your compression ratio. Yep. So Greg and Stu, um, you are saving video, no? Go, uh, go ahead, Jan, if there's more to that. I'd for, just be curious um, also what they're doing for... Yeah, for uh, anyway, for example, for saving videos, the question is probably less uh, compression, but also uh, record size. And the other problem with databases like MySQL or Postgres is that they have a block size for their B-trees of 8 or 16 kilobytes, which uh, also means that you don't have multiple block sizes underneath that to uh, compress into if you start at that, because mm -hmm. uh, normally you have 4K uh, sectors on your storage devices reported to the kernel these days. And you can't go below two to the power of A shift. So yeah, so with an A shift of uh, 12, so four kilobytes, there aren't many chances to, that you can half your block. Mm -hmm. The problem is the moment you use parity rate, so rate Z1 or rate Z2, you end up with partial uh, swipes where you still have to pay the full parity, but can at best use fewer non-parity blocks. So effectively your usable capacity uh, reduces because at worst you may have, let's say, Rate Z3, so three parity blocks, but if you only allocate one data block to that, yeah, that's hmm. effectively the same as a four way mirror of the capacity point of view, because you don't have any valid data to put in there. For D rate, you would waste a full size stripe because you can't allocate less. So yeah, the, the larger your swipes are with parity rates, the bigger your blocks have to be mm -hmm. to get even uh, just naturally aligned blocks, let alone have blocks big enough to 
um, get nice sequential transfers from each member of your rate group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, to kick it off, has anyone gone beyond a one megabyte record size? I believe up to 16 is supported. I have just to, yeah, just to, just to do benchmarking. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely diminishing returns for compression after. Not just for know. compression, also for uh, IOPS, yeah. because you reach a size uh, around yeah, 128K to one megabyte where you're getting above 80% of your sequential uh, streaming performance per disk which is just good enough and you're chasing as said diminishing returns for um, the other advantages with um, bigger blocks is that potentially the per block overhead especially the cache footprint is smaller so the arc entry is the same size no matter how big the block trapped in it is so it can allow you to use less uh, main memory on the metadata, leaving more available for data caching. But the downside is that, yeah, it's such a big transfer time per block now, unless hmm. you have very fast storage that your latency suffers. Interesting. I've actually taken it to 4 meg. 4 meg, cool, yeah. cool. I normally stop at one meg in production, but I've played around with it on a test pool and found even for a, yeah, 36 or 45 disk pool, at least of spinning disks, no advantages. Stu, is that in uh, production or just an experiment like the other two? Um, it's actually production over ice casing. Nice. Okay, with iSCSI, so high latency, uh, deep queues, and potentially high bandwidth, that could change. Hmm. And it is, yeah, it's 100 gig network, so yeah. Um, so back to the database side. Sure. Um, my standard is always, you do not try and overthink what the database has already thought of. <laughs> yeah. So there's a reason the databases are efficient. Let them be efficient, compress the backups. Let them run as fast as they are designed to run without anything getting in the way. Then when you're taking backups, exports, anything else, yeah, compress the hell out of the data, but let the databases do what they are paid to do. Except for ZFS's compressed memory, which can, I mean, that's, you can, you can get some objective performance gains there. Well, but that's, again, it's very, it's very tied to a situation. It's not necessarily, hey, this is a, you know, this, this statement covers 80% of deployments or 95% of deployments. Yeah, there's always going to be one-offs and there are ways to do things efficiently and there are certain ways that databases have been designed <clears throat> either really, really well or really, really poorly that mm -hmm. can be made very efficient that way. But... <laughs> Does that mean you're using no compression on a data set for a database? Correct. Okay. Let it run balls out. Yeah. Until your SSD compresses it. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, Steve N, we are talking about record sizes, alignment, and the potential for write amplification. Hopefully the minutes are vaguely helpful. And if you haven't seen it, Matt Aaron's produced in a blog post long ago, back in 2014, when LZ4 compression arrived, and how all those rules we used to follow on parity raid planning went out the window thanks to compression. So it's a it's a good read, bit of a milestone there. And Steve, do you have any topics or questions? Uh, just listening in today. Cool. Do, do, do. Um, we have talked databases and media, which I confess are the two I've put any thought into. 
Uh, I have heard of, say, high frequency traders using maximum uh, Z standard compression to slam as much data into a given system to give them an advantage. Um, are there other concerns for more mundane data or highly compressible text or other use cases where you've had to think about it or have you just let it go with the defaults and let it rip? Regarding compressed files, I found it so useful to just uh, not do a lock compression on rotation and just keep the uncompressed logs and let ZFS handle it so that the current log file and the older log files on the system can be read by the same tool. So you don't have to cut it together. <laughs> so you're keeping your logs compressed or letting ZFS I keep do them. In uncompressed files, and then let ZFS compress the whole data set. Yeah. ZFS is compressing the whole data set anyway. Yeah. There's no reason exactly. to make work hard on yourself if you want to go back and look at them. Absolutely. And the other thing is the advantage of log files are such a trivially compressible corner case most of the time that the advantage of BZR2, the default one used by FreeBSD for log compression, Yes, it's better than LZ4, but not that much. And if you have that much local data in just plain text file, you have a bigger problem. But it matters if you find the convenience of just being able to grab dash R my log files a lot more important. Hmm. And if you are really concerned about not having enough compression on your log files, you can change the compression type used by ZFS. Oh, yeah. Of course, so, but I've never found it to be a problem. No, that's, yeah, that's why I think it's kind of silly if I didn't make that clear. You've probably seen of course you could use the standard CSD charts. Level 20 if you really wanted to. I'll try to find those. It was Kind of cool. Uh, it's a PDF, and I don't know why they do it, but I'll drop it in first the chat. So there was an article that I suppose I can drop in here, and at least it's nicely formatted. So yeah, uh, here, uh, note. Let's put that there. I want to so it's free BSD journal, perhaps. So it's a good article with pretty pictures. And I always like a pretty picture as it communicates a concept. So note. I'm glad he went sciencey. Uh other thoughts or links or other ways to communicate this to new users and those who might be wasting a whole bunch of storage space in for movie. And that said, you mentioned the wiki, Daniel, is that probably where this wisdom should live? Especially if it's been, I don't know, oh, formalized in an article, which like the conference paper I'm working on right now is a really good motivator to be scientific rather than kind of sloppy, but eventually that should probably hit the official docs. Yeah, I think the FreeBSD wiki has some, some you know, tips, suggestions, etc. And also, the OpenZFS wiki yeah, they, should too. And of course, the databases themselves, their documentation they usually have supplements like I think MySQL and Maria both have tells tell you exactly what to do with ZFS on their pages. Cool. This is true. There was a moment there when obviously no database was ZFS aware, and then they actually, you know, had folks like doing Postgres on ZFS at Sun back in the day. Regarding Postgres and other databases. Uh, if you want to get the best performance out of it, some databases now have documentation on what is safe to do on a ZFS file system, but not on a generic 
POSIX compliant file system because ZFS offers stronger ordering and consistency guarantees. So for example, even in the face of power losses, ZFS will not uh, show torn writes to databases. So they as long can- As as your disks are honest. Yeah. Even then it's a checksum error and uh, it's, but on uh, something like uh, UFS or X4 or something, you can see on power loss a write system call being non-atomic and you see it partially written page. Hmm. Uh, stuff like this may require databases to double buffer the journal while we don't have to do that on ZFS. So there are guides there, but it's highly da database specific. Uh, but sometimes this is for Postgres or so on, it's documented what you can do to get a bit more out of it. A little more without risking, yeah, without uh, risking your data uh, integrity. Things you can turn off, which are normally required defensive programming strategies to deal with the very loose uh, POSIX semantics. But if you know you're on top of ZFS, you can get away with uh, less slowdown uh, in your right path. Because ZFS does the equivalent already for you. But I don't have ready to use guides for that. So, Greg, your chat is tiny on my screen, so I will. For what's worth, so I'm going to just. 800 terabytes of projects and oh Z, Z standard fast three. And, yeah, I, I use that because I Alan told me that it would uh, bail if it decided that the data was uncompressible pretty quickly. It would, but does that check every single write? That's the early, early abort. I think it checks it if it gets beyond 12.5 percent, but um. So survey, I'm guessing that would just want to be on an uncompressed data set just to eliminate that depends continuous on, latency. And it depends on your hardware too. Okay, I mean, fair like enough. Said, you know. Well, like like Jan was saying, yeah. the you know, you may have plenty of CPU and so the CPU constraint is a lot, but it is going to cause you a bit more latency. Because it still has to get to the point where it realizes, oh, I can bail. Yeah. Yes, but uh, on the other end, if you're still on spinning disks and it is compressible, it can be that the time spent compressing is less than the time you would otherwise have spent transferring that much data. So it and really depends. It's, there is no one size fits all answer. Absolutely. But in a video centric world, I do not run compression ever. And because it wouldn't get you anything. Seven percent on a disk write of a you know six hundred gig file is not worth the effort, in my opinion. And God forbid anything runs slowly for post production people. That oh, it's a tenth of a second slower now. Why can't I click here four times when I used to be able to click five? Yeah, that kind of stuff is reality of production users, not theoretical, hey, it would be great ifs. So again. And the answer is just get enough storage bandwidth and capacity. Yeah, hmm. I agree. The uh, production yeah, of that there's... system doesn't have any sort of compression on it. Hmm. When you're when you're talking about you know these kinds of use cases there isn't enough bandwidth capacity. They will right. use whatever capacity you throw at them. Yep. Until, you, until you're until you bound by the interface. No, until you, they start, are connected until to you start charging them back for use. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's all free <laughs> until, oh, I have to pay 10 cents. 10 cents an IOP. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh, don't give them a idea. A little high, but I'm going to be much more efficient in what I'm actually asking for if I'm getting charged for it. So again, it goes back to infinite 
resources, infinite money, infinite time, anything's possible. Yeah. What I meant is uh, that it is possible to saturate the 40 gig or whatever you have network connection to a workstation using NFS or SMB. And then if your pool can keep up with that, you've d done your capacity and bandwidth planning correctly because now that storage isn't the bottleneck networking is, so you have the next bottleneck to work on. And then the workstations are too slow and they need more memory. Mm -hmm. Exactly. More it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, always, it's always a cycle and whatever that saturation to dollar sure. amount is, is where the pain is going to be felt. Yeah, I'm sure they get a chance. They want something like a Honey Badger card full of uh, NVMe drives uh, striped as uh, local scratch space, and they will make use of it. Yep. Until they start moaning that all their PCI lanes are blocked by storage now, and they don't, can't put in enough GPUs to do the actual processing. <laughs> So should we talk pricing strategies? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah. Other topics. I've got some cloning to Bring it talk on. about. But yes, sir. Unless anybody else wants to go, because I already went. <laughs> I, I just had one more thing on the Please. compression side. Is anybody using compression for hosting LLMs? Do LLM compress? as in language module modules and AI. Yeah. All righty, good question. Have Are they image-based have... ones or text? Text. Text. Uh, read the the met the trained model is just basically very tiny precision floats, right? So the question is, how well does it compress? Well, it's not just the, the it's the full IO life cycle is what my question is. Yeah, oh, okay. can, I, can I create, you know, a hundred times the amount of stuff on it, but getting it out of it takes three times as long or four times or 400 times as long. Just if there's anybody that has experience, the only stuff I've done with it, honestly, is... Um, um, creating SRT files for um, subtitles for videos. So it actually does, you know, it listens to the video and then creates it based upon mm -hmm. the language model. The question, you know, is has anybody played with the different compression levels and types in that realm to say, hey, this is most efficient holistically, not just this is how much storage you can keep off of. I haven't, but have you looked at your I.O. patterns? If it actually has an I.O. behavior where it becomes meaningful, doesn't the software just slurp the model into main memory on startup and then, or even into the GPU's dedicated local memory and then just process there with natural bandwidth going in and out? It well, like assume model, that you're on startup, it just loads the model and then processes it, in memory, and the resulting SRT file is so it, small it doesn't it, matter. If it's small, small enough, yes. If it's and I'm listening to this one video and I'm creating eight different languages, including Korean, Chinese, Japanese, kanji type things as well. That's where it gets more complex because now you're doing multiple things at once off that same master set. So mm. yeah, just if there's anybody that has played with it or is about to play with it, I'd be interested to see what what that is because that hasn't boiled up to my front, middle, or back burner yet. <laughs> if it is, yeah, I'd be from. interested to. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what the. The relationship to between memory and the processing is because it's not just whether it's compressed on the disk. If it's if CFS is compressed, it's compressed in memory. 
So you're never touching the disk, depending on unless you're unless you're pulling data straight off the disks. Then I could see it, it being a you know a bottleneck. But if if uh, you know if anything's getting into Arc, then it could pay off if it's if it's memory limited, because you get a hell of a lot more stuff into into Arc. It's compressed. Is that faster than real time? So you could pull out eight languages at four times playback speed or something? Still, uh, right, right, now, to see. Yeah, right now, the evaluation is is doing two at this yep. It's about 2.6, 2.7x um, for what playback. I Yeah, so... Yeah, our I would movie, assume that you're doing movie. so much. Hold on, let him finish. Yeah. per byte of data, the, the compression overhead is really noticeable, other than when you load the model. But that's just an unfounded assumption. Hmm. And unless you're uh, running your model on the CPU, you're not using uh, main memory, so you're not uh, con you're not fighting with the arc for capacity because the arc won't use the GPU memory. Oh yeah. So uh, does your model fit into the GPU with all the context it needs? If so. It runs at the speed it runs. If you have to swap out to main memory, yes, then performance will tank. But again, I don't see how the arc can help you there, other than not have to evict dirty buffer pages before you can use the memory. So, and then neither basically reading in the video finding the uh, interleaved audio uh, streams between uh, the video data and then decoding the audio on the CPU is probably, again, not really performance critical because we're talking about decoding, let's say eight uh, audio streams at two point something X speed. That's a joke for the modern CPU, even for a single core. And then you play the samples into a, a model. And that's where you spend almost all of your compute, probably so much compute per second of audio that the IO performance is the problem. So is at that taking, the go ahead. At least not the reading the compressed video file format. So is that taking cues from the video or could you just strip out the video and only process audio on a dedicated machine? That's that's one of the the approaches. We actually you know strip the audios and that way the video have to move and then just bring back the SRTs. Yeah okay. Yeah because you know we could all handle that quality audio back in the 90s and then along came the video challenge um i are you able to reveal the size of the length the language model mod uh, sorry uh, uh the data set of i guess language data like spoken language data that might get thrown into either memory or gpu ram i'd have to go back and look are you using this to create the initial uh, text for the subtitles, or are you just translating the subtitles from, for example, English to other languages? No, creating from raw. Right. The, the Any text-to-text -text could be completely external, I'm assuming. Just yeah. sync it right up. Yeah, that's mm. the, it's the taking it live. I mean, and most of it's it's not for things like feature films or anything else that already has that already built in. It's more of, hey, this is a Easter church service. We want the entire thing done in five languages at once. Yep. And um, real time while streaming? And in real time. Preferably, yes. Interesting, okay. But starring that would also be interesting for a digital asset management system if you can do full text on the audio. 
that is part so of that you can that part search of, in of, the subtitle yeah. basically that is part of the part of one of our our product designs yes hmm. so it's not as structured as a log file but it sure sounds like text hitting just a directory i, I mean <laughs> the out the output for two hours is 200k yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> look out <laughs> that's the sick part about this and it means yeah. it's really easy but yeah, very, that's like one block. <laughs> it's it's taking a dump truck to go to Home Depot. Type exactly. Thing. Cool. That was it. Yeah. Uh, it's you fascinating. Like I'm glad you planted that speed. Go ahead, Jan on dump trucks. <laughs> it sounds more like using a dump truck to uh, go to 7 Eleven. Yeah, exactly. Or a tanker truck to get a slip. Anyway, Daniel, you want to talk clones and you're diligently punching in your question. It's uh, not it's not a it's not a question per se. It's, okay. It's something right. it's something I did not understand about clones. And I've asked 37 brilliant experts about clones, and I just now understand it. And it's it's great because I don't think it it occurs in many replication tools out there, um, but but you know now I can do it manually. So so this this bit of ZFS received uh, of man ZFS received yep. never quite made sense to me. Um, so what I what I imagined is you clone you clone something from a snapshot, of course, yeah. and then from that snapshot, okay, it is a it is a you know, it is a clone, it is a version of the snapshot, right? So I imagine, okay, well, if I clone something, then I can replicate snapshots. And what that means is that when you have a divergent snapshot, so say you have a B, C, ransomware strikes, D, E, and then you roll back and you make a clone of C. I'll give you some, okay. oops, sorry. My, I'll give you some space. Sorry, my bad. Mm. No, it's it's yeah. cool. Uh, yeah, it's so just... so I would I would imagine that on my backup, I can now okay. So now we've had a diversion on the source, and then I would imagine that the source rolls back. Okay, so, um, so now we have, so now we've, now on the, on the, um, on the source in the backup, we might have a replica of all of those things. Now, now get now I did a rollback. Now get me F and G onto this backup. And the thing is, you can't because C isn't a uh, because C isn't a, isn't a snapshot. It's a clone. So so this little phrase um, of of um, from man ZFS received dash O origin snapshot that generates a new clone based on the origin. So what that means, so so what that means is you can, you know, you can you can have two divergent backups on a system based on an origin clone from the from the target. I'm sorry, this is a little hard to articulate, but the point is that you can create a clone. Um, you can create. You can you can basically have a backup of everything. Now this is this is extremely critical for me because I deal with uh, financial companies, I deal with you know with doctors' offices, I deal with lawyers, and even if there's a ransomware event, I have to keep that data. I have to keep the yeah. the, the damaged data. Now of course that is going to be on the source machine because I've cloned it, right? I've made a I've made a clone of the of the source. But then in order to get that to the backup machine, I thought what I thought was um, I would have to, um, uh, I thought that I, I would have to do a full, a full backup to get the, to get the remaining bits. Um, but that's, that's not true. And here's the, here's the phrase 
here's the here's the phrase that makes the magic happen. Let me see. And everybody on this call might know this. This is this might just be news to me, but uh, um, yeah, let me see. I have it. I'm gonna I'm gonna test literally with A B C D here. We'll give it some space. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. All right, so so here we so I pasted I pasted it in if you can see the document. So you just specify the origin and it generates a clone of C and then it'll and then it'll copy, you know, uh, the the incremental the incremental stream the, the incremental stream after that. So what that does is it allows you to let's say your your backup is is eight million terabytes, and then you have a ransomware event. And you get you get a little bit there. You can get the source and backup of both of, of both streams on your backup server. Um, which and the heavy which lifting is the dash o. Yep, the heavy lifting is the dash o. So now it doesn't. You can't attach those snapshots to an existing clone. It it generates a new clone, but who cares? Clone zero, right? So you so, basically fork at that point. Exactly, and what that means is that. Minus capital F on ZFS receive is is essentially, I mean, there, there's some tidying that need, that has to go that has to go into it, but the but the concept of of clobbering your backup when your your source when your source needs a rollback is, you know, the ZFS devs. Well, the ZFS the ZFS devs have have figured that out. Yeah. it's just. It's just a little bit of a confusing line there in the now, now there could be really good documentation out there for this, but I haven't I haven't found it. And for people in high compliance industries like me, this this is you know, it hasn't been that big of a deal because the most I've wasted is like a terabyte um on uh, on a ransomware event that I that I had to get. You know that I have to get backups all over the place, but then my sources are a mess because, you know, I can't fork the, you know, the repaired bit back into the into the old snapshot tree. So I have uh, backups and archives and and broken you know broken chains of, of uh, you know of of snapshots like that. Um, so this also means that. You know, if, if it's working from a clone uh, with the, you know, with the later chain of snapshots after it, this would be a way to keep. Now, I, I had this conversation with Alan. He laughed, laughed at me because he was like, "Well, just delete your delete your snapshots if you have too many snapshots." But <laughs> you can you can intentionally break your snapshots up by years with this technique. So you. You know, you create a clone and then you continue the tree um, along, and you can break it up into into archives by year, and then your ZFS list don't take take forever. So these are, you know, it's just a it, it's just another thing you can do with ZFS. That it's another it's another way to use it that isn't the isn't in the sort of basic in the basic how tos. After ten years of using this thing, I'm still finding new cool things to do with it. You know? Exactly. Um. So, can you be lazy and just use the dash o, and it will handle clones correctly, or will that be resulting in some other unforeseen surprise? Uh, dash so the o dash by itself is specifically that you're going to do one of these kind of options like origin. It's also or a number of property values type mm -hmm. things also depend on that dash o. So hmm. you do need that origin type syntax. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you yeah. off. And, no, and, it's, it's and, great. And just to yeah, and just to clarify, that dash o is pointing to the local pool. It has to be on the local pool. So it's a it's a it has to be the exact GID of C from the from the source. Um, and then and it's that local copy of that GID snapshot, that equal GID snapshot, GUID, sorry. Um and then 
Oh, you can, man. yeah, you can, you can fork trees of snapshots. I, I had no idea it was that easy. And, and I mean, it's just, I mean, it's like one of those things that I think that a lot of people think they've got it. Right. And uh, there's just another little trick you got to know to do it. Are our friends over in Zelta land incorporating that? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. I guess that's what it is. Um, is this any different from on the backup target creating a clone and then uh, sending it to that clone? Yeah, clone so that's the trick. Uh, so you could, uh, you, you would have to do a ZFS receive or uh, you would have to do a ZFS receive or a ZFS send dash capital R in order for it to work because the uh, clone itself is not a snapshot. So you cannot attach future future snapshots to that clone. I thought you could, and I so asked a lot of to... confused questions. So you, it has to be a ZFS, it has to be generated with a ZFS receive. So in other words, you need at least two snapshots to make it happen. Um, one for the clone and one for the, uh, the snapshot that will be attached to it. And then from that snapshot, you can then continue your chain. So do that's the, that's why know, I was confused. Do you know if you can only use snapshots or also bookmarks for this? I don't know. I don't know if bookmarks how bookmarks uh, are involved in this. Again, I feel like every other week we talk about bookmarks, and I'm like, I'm going to learn them one day. Um, but no, I didn't get. I didn't test it with that. Orthogonally, do note checkpoints, which can checkpoint the entire pool, effectively snapshotting the entire pool at a certain state. I mean, I have the documentation right. up. The documentation does not rec uh, reference bookmarks or um, checkpoints at all. So my default answer is probably not. Or if it does, it's a bug. Daniel, do you well, think the manual I've page can those. express this better? Because like this so, is literally the facts, but yeah, not super helpful. I mean, I think an example is important because the idea that you that that it's so or not not so easy per se. I mean, it's you know, this is ZFS is clearly a tool that's you know meant for operators building appliances and such. So it's nothing's going to be that easy, but. Right. But yeah, I, mean, I think a couple a couple more examples in the wild and a you know a teaching tool, replication tools that that do this, and maybe there are, and I just I just miss them, and I'm not I'm not aware of them. Um, but you know, clearly people have talked about it on GitHub, and I've, I've found some conversations out there on it. Um, but I did a little digging, and I didn't find you know people talking about this as something that that really needs to be in every admin's back back pocket because like a you know divergent divergent trees of clones are something that's going to happen mm -hmm. frequently and taking full backups every time that happens is um well it's what i was doing for 10 years whether it was smart or not mm. Any questions for Daniel and Dan L? Do you have any questions or topics? No, I don't. Cool. Well, you're welcome to review the minutes. We went through alignment of record sizes and, and application block sizes, such as databases, logs, and Stu had a fascinating question about uh, AI and language models in, I guess, real time or faster than real time, uh, making uh, a, a subtitles for videos. So that was fascinating. Anyway, well, I'm uh, never. One other Go annoying ahead. note about the one Please. more annoying note about the ZFS send thing you have to specify the full. <laughs> this, this doesn't make any sense. You can't, for the ZFS send part, you can't do at. C, you have to do you have to do the full name of it for some reason. So um, it is maybe a little buggy. That's not buggy. There, the reason for that is that you can have your origin be in a completely different section of the file system. 
So, oh, all right. Yeah. That's okay. why it requires yeah, that's, that full path. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. Well, so pool this, data set, data set snapshot syntax, like what would be different? Oh, just in, in normally with dash I, dash I or dash capital I, you can yeah. just do the at, uh, at snapshot oh, name and it. It will, it. and it will imply the, it'll imply, it will imply the, um, the full, uh, the full data set name. Got it. But the origin section could be in a completely different part of the um, file or pool hierarchy. Is that the right? I don't know the right, right word here, but there, the, you know what? That's I think on the ZFS dev call, or uh, one of the I, I haven't been on them, but I've you know I've looked. P people are arguing about terminology. It like mm -hmm. like data set means everything. I use the word tree. I, I basically made up my own terminology to, for my notes because it's, it's not perfect. But hierarchy, element, uh, <laughs> data set, it's, it's all. We really fast. need a glossary page for all of this. Yeah, I am, I'm writing one for my dumb thing. Well, Anything else? Go ahead. Well, all that one. Repeat that, Stu, was it? Plus 12 that we need a glossary page or consistency in documentation. Yes. And that was my challenge with the native encryption was that when they split up the manual pages, certain key references to other pages fell off. And it was very confusing to have partial examples with no list of all the options to look up. So, yeah. Well, now I'm always still trying to. Me yeah, it, oh, over in my world, in the in the uh, Illumos world, we still have ZFS as being a single giant man Amazing. page. Cool. I want to say, whoever first came up with the idea of splitting man pages into smaller parts, like for example, ZFS create and stuff like that, what a great idea! It was at yes. a developer summit. I forget his name, but yeah, he just popped in and did that. It was very cool. Uh, Jan, did yes, you want to talk to E-Rage for a second? Thing. Yeah, I just, I'm just curious if, uh, if anyone put D-Rate in production on a big enough pool to be worth it, uh, what you found works as accompanying uh, VDEVs to compensate for a D-Rate's downsides. Or what workloads because I don't have a right lab to test that out. Yeah, Stu and Greg, if you ever have a new system prior to deployment, feel free to go all sciencey on D RAID and planning. Because few of us have meaningful large systems or ones we can spend more than like five minutes with. Yeah, yeah I haven't even uh, tested. D-rated in files yet. No, I'm interested in trying it. Yeah. yeah. It might it might fit into the pool in the next couple months. For me. Oh. Uh, I have a old J board with old disks. I put it into a D rate and yes, it basically works. And as is to be expected, if you put 40 old spinning disks or 42 into a D rate uh, with triple redundancy. Yes, you get storage, sequential reads and writes are okay, but uh, I don't have the op option of now attaching fast enough uh, the other disks or SSDs mostly uh, for the metadata and uh, play around with that. Mm. And yeah, it would be nice to have some di just artificial benchmarks uh, or stuff like it's just here are the fire cursors uh, and the impacts of using uh, metadata special allocation class uh, a dedicated lock vdef and so on well we are squarely at one hour shall we call it there for no specific reason I'm good with that awesome I'm happy to stick around a few minutes. I will call it, and I thank you all so much for participating. Okay.
You all have a good week. I'll see you next week. Awesome. Take care. Have a good one.